Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number seven in this series about taking the limits off God. I'm going to tell you this is such a simple but powerful series. I have had people all over the world tell me that my book on taking the limits off of God was one of the simplest clear-cut ways to introduce people to some of these radical new concepts. So, you know, if you've got somebody you're ministering to and you want to introduce them to, to solid biblical concepts of faith, then I recommend the book. And, of course, you can always get the audio series. You know, in this message today, we're, we're just, I'm, I'm titling this, Help My Unbelief. You know, in some circles, it is really a humiliation to admit your struggles concerning faith. And really, we're forced to pretend that we really do believe something when, in fact, we really don't. Well, that's, that's, that's what a hypocrite does. A hypocrite pretends that something is real, even though it's not real. They pretend that they are a certain person when, in fact, they really are not. Now, God doesn't hate you for doing that because the real truth is uh, he, he, we're not hypocrites in this sense like the Sadducees and the Pharisees were. We're just hypocrites in the sense that we have been shamed into pretending like we have faith many times in situations where our lives are on the line or where other people's lives are on the line. Now, we've got to own our unbelief, and this, this is a key thing. You can't solve a problem that you don't own. You can't, you can't win out of battle that you never admit that you're having. We live in a time when 1 John 1, 9 has just been, has been criticized, has been scrutinized, and really by people who don't really understand what it's saying. The whole concept of, of confessing our sins is interesting. The word confess uh, is a compound word, and one part of that word means it comes from the Greek word homo, which means the same, say the same thing. And the second part of that word comes from the logos. And so, so we're supposed to confess the same thing that the logos does. That means I need to confess my weaknesses as much as I need to confess Christ in me, as much as I need to confess what God has done to, to solve the problem and take care of it. And unfortunately, religion in the past has just made it about admitting your sin. Well, you do need to admit your sin, or in this case, admit your, your unbelief. But the Logos goes on to tell us what Jesus accomplished. You know, it's kind of interesting in the book of Revelation when it talks about people who are overcomers. Uh, it, says, it says that they overcome by the word of the testimony. Well, that comes from the Logos of the testimony. Our testimony and our victory that we live in is more than just a formula. It's about Jesus, the living Word of God, and what He has, in fact, done in us. So, so on in our belief means right off the bat that we can't blame other people for our struggle. You know, we can't blame God. We can't blame the devil. It, the moment that we start doing this, we are actually not owning the problem. Therefore, again, like I said, you cannot own a problem that, or you can't overcome a problem that you do not own. Uh, I think in the Hebrew, the concept of confessing means like to pick up a rock. If you get a rock in your shoe and you never admit that it's there, you're going to end up with a sore, uh, maybe an infection in your foot, but when you admit that it's there, what do you do? You reach down, you take hold of the rock, and just throw it away. It's just that simple. And I'll tell you, there is nothing to be ashamed of when we are honest with God and even honest with people around us about, uh, about our struggle with faith. You know, one of the places where I've seen this happen so many times, uh, God has led me to be there for many people when, when they're on their deathbed. One of the things I will always do, and God would always arrange it, that I would show up when all the family wanted to leave, go eat or whatever. And I said, I'll, I'll just stay here with this person. And 
when everybody would leave, I would have a conversation with that person. I would say, look, you're telling everybody you're going to get healed. You're telling everybody you're going to overcome this. But do you really believe that's what's going to happen? I can't tell you how many times that person would say, no, not really. Well, my question to them is, well, then why are you saying it? I remember one of the last times I was with a man, good man, a godly man, who had an incredibly dominating wife, who if he didn't go along with everything that she wanted, she would just browbeat him and complain. So here he is on his deathbed, and he's he's talking the faith talk. And I said, do you? You really believe you're going to get healed? No. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm I'm through. I'm tired. I am ready to go. Where I've had a great life. I said, well, well, why don't you tell your family that? He said, because if I do, they are going to get mad at me and they're going to fuss at me. And I, and I just can't go through that right now. And I said, well, if you're really wanting to fight this battle and win, I'll help you. But if you are ready to cross over, then it's time for you to get your family together and let them know that you've run your race, that you're finished and you're ready to cross over, but you want their permission. You want them to, to, to bless you in this decision that you have made. And so he did, he got his whole family together. I think they ended up hating my guts for it because, you know, they were convinced that, that, they were going, that he was going to live. He was going to overcome this disease. But remember, he was to the place where he didn't want to fight anymore. He did not want to struggle anymore. So he gathered his family together and he said, he said, look, I need for you guys to bless this decision because I am through fighting this battle. I am ready to go meet the Lord. And so they reluctantly agreed with, with him. And he made the decision and they all prayed together about it. And, uh, you know, he, he acknowledged to the Lord, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to be with you. Well, very shortly thereafter, he enjoyed a very peaceful death. Just think of the people that are tormented because if they, if they tell the truth about their faith or tell the truth about their unbelief, man, they get criticized, they get mocked, they get put down. And everybody in the world wants to come and, and, and fix their unbelief problem. So, so we, have to, we have to own our unbelief, and we have to choose. Remember, one of the primary factors of faith, you know, the primary factor is trusting God's faithfulness, trusting that anything that God has ever said that he'll do, he will, that he will absolutely do it. That's, that's the first part of, uh, of moving toward faith. But the second most essential uh, component of faith is making a decision. We have to make decisions. Now, I'm telling you, I have seen people that refuse, even though they want it to cross over, they refuse to either because they were afraid or because they were, thought they would be letting their family down. And I've watched them linger for weeks and months because in their heart, they could not trust God to help them cross over. And I'll tell you, whether it's, whether it's a life and death situation or whether it's just believing for something else in general, we have to make a choice based on what we believe about God and what we believe the truth is. Now, I want you to understand something. We go through some phases to get to unbelief. We don't just, we don't just wake up one day and suddenly... We, we don't believe God. And if we understand the phases that we go through to get to unbelief, then we can reverse engineer that process and we can bring ourselves back to a true immovable faith in God. Now, all unbelief starts with hearing and entertaining things that are contrary to what God has said and or contrary to the character and nature of God. Now, most believers, sadly, have no comprehension of the character and nature of God because instead of looking at Jesus to understand who God is, they look into religion, they look at superstition, they pay attention to what their favorite preacher says. They look everywhere except the Bible, where the Bible tells us to look at. But we want to understand the character and nature of God. We look at Jesus, and if Jesus never did something, 
then we should realize it's out of the scope of the character and nature of God. So we don't have to be afraid that God's going to do it. You know, Jesus never killed anybody. Jesus never cursed anybody. Jesus never made anybody suffer so God would get glory out of it. There are so many things where we deny the Lord Jesus uh, because we don't believe, according to Hebrews 1.3, that he is the exact representation of God. So we get misinformation and we start entertaining that misinformation. Uh, and as we begin to think on this and ponder on this, it starts to affect the beliefs of our heart. So, so when we begin to consider this, then we go into wavering. Now, wavering is just exactly what it sounds like. It's, and, and the example that the book of James uses is like a boat that keeps rocking back and forth uh, because it's tossed back and forth by, by the waves. And that's called wavering. Now, in the Greek, the word wavering is very different than the word unbelief. It's very different than the word being tempted. You say, what do you mean being tempted? Well, actually, when we, when we consider things that are inconsistent with who God is and, and we begin to ponder on them, then we're giving in to a temptation to feed our unbelief, probably because we're afraid uh, to believe, we're afraid to step out. But anyhow, so, so, so it's a process. Now, when, you, when you're wavering, it's really interesting, because to waver really means to shift between two different points. And that's what, again, that goes back to the whole idea of a boat rolling on top of the wave. And, sh and so that's us shifting from one thought, one opinion over to another opinion. And, you know, the book of James tells us this. He says, now, listen, uh, and I'll put the now listen in there. That, that's, that's not really there. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive. Now, it's kind of interesting. The word receive in the Greek is nearly always the word lambano. It's not a passive receiving. It's a taking hold of something. And we take hold of God's promises by our faith. So when I think about taking hold of something in a situation where I'm wavering, I think about, and I've, I've had this happen to me where I'd be on a small boat, and we would be pulling up to the dock to stop, and whoever would be driving the boat would say, go up there and, and get a hold of this post and tie us off. Well, the problem is when you're wavering, you're reaching for the post, but the boat's going back and forth, so you're having a hard time actually getting hold of the post. Well, that's what wavering does to you. It's like being on a rocking ship trying to get hold of something, and that, that getting a hold of is the receiving. But it's basically saying you are double-minded or double-souled. So if I have a double soul, it means that my emotions are changing back and forth because of this wavering that's going on. Now, our emotions are primarily determined by what we're focusing on. And so let's say that I let's say that I've got a battle going, I'm struggling financially, and man, I got I've got these bills that, that just keep coming in. And so, you know, I go through the bills every night trying to figure out what I'm gonna do, trying to figure out how I'm gonna pay them. So I'm putting all of my attention on these bills that are due, which means all of my emotions now are going to be about this debt that I'm trying to get out of. And so since I'm placing my attention there, then I am wavering in that direction. Well, let's say somebody comes over and, and they're a prayer warrior and, and they, they say, listen, let's pray about this. So you pray, you, you, you worship God, and then now your focus is put back on God. So now you've rocked over the other way. And so you rock over the other way, and then 
you get to thinking about the bills again. So you go back and, and start pondering how bad your life is, how bad it's going. So now you wave back over the other way. And that's what wavering is. You put your attention on something. It stirs up your emotions. You end up with having two souls or being double soul. And so, you know, when you're looking over here at the problem, your emotions are all about the problem. When you're looking over here at the promise, then suddenly uh, all of this negative stuff in, in, your, in your heart goes away. Now, wisdom is the ability uh, to put the truth into practice and actually see it work. And it's kind of interesting. James didn't say that when you are struggling and facing something like this, he didn't say ask for a miracle. That's what most of us are going to do. God, you fix this. You take care of this. No, James said, ask for wisdom. Ask God what truth you need to put into practice in order, in order to start coming out of this. And then, of course, after wavering, eventually, if you, if you don't turn your focus on God, if you don't admit your unbelief, then you're, you're going to finally go straight to unbelief. Now, unbelief in the Greek is, is, the, is the word ah. Anytime you see an A in front of a word, uh, so it's apistos, and that means no belief. In other words, you no longer have any belief in the faithfulness of God. Now, you may be talking the faithfulness, you may be saying the, the right words, but in your heart, you don't have belief. And so once, once you get there, You've either got to reverse this process uh, or you're going to be destroyed. You're going to, your finances are going to be destroyed. Your health is going to be destroyed. Your marriage is going to be destroyed, whatever. You know, one of my favorite stories, I'm not going to read the whole thing because of time. But one of my favorite stories takes place in Mark 9, 20 through 24, where a man brings his son to Jesus. And this, this, uh, 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 his son has fits as they would have called it back in the old days, or con convulsions, and he'd fall on the ground, he'd foam at the mouth, all this kind of stuff. And so, and so it's kind of interesting. He actually, the man, actually turns to Jesus and says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus' answer would not feel very compassionate, but it is compassionate. Because, you see, every promise of God, and we're going to look at this in the next message, every promise of God is yes for you. Anything that God's ever promised anybody, the answer is already yes for you if you are in Christ. Now, I realize that this took place before the cross, but the principle is still the same thing. So, so the man's desperate. He says, okay, Jesus, if you can do anything, Jesus looked back at him and said, no. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And so the father, he, you know, I, I'm sure he succumbed to religious pressure. And, uh, he, and he cried out and said, Lord, I do believe. Then he told the, what was really in his heart, but help my unbelief. Jesus didn't get on to him for having unbelief. Jesus was able to bring him to, and Jesus was trying to get him to confess his unbelief so that he could actually experience a miracle for his child. He was trying to get him to confess. So, you know, people who think that confession is not important or doesn't have any value, the real truth is uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, in Romans chapter four, I'm going to try to rush through this just so I can get all of this in, in, this, uh, in this message. Romans chapter 4 is talking about Abraham, the father of faith. Now, as the father of faith, actually, Abraham's the father of faith righteousness, not just faith in general, but all concepts of faith, particularly faith righteousness. And so God had made all these promises to Abraham. Now, that would mean that when you would go back in the scriptures, according to 2 Corinthians 1.20, and you would see these promises that God made to Abraham, unless they were very specific. There were specific promises God made to Abraham that would not be for us. Like, we're not going to be the father uh, of many nations. We're, we're not going to be uh, the, the bloodline through whom the Messiah comes. And you have to kind of sort that out. 
But all the general promises that God ever made to anyone is yes for us because we are in Jesus. And so God makes these overwhelming promises. And then it says, verse 19 of Romans 4 says, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Now, interestingly, in the Greek, uh, many of the scholars contend that that says just the opposite. Not being weak in faith, he did consider his own body. In other words, he didn't hide his head in the sand. He wasn't afraid to look at the facts. He looked at the fact that that uh, uh, he was almost 100 years old. There was no reason to believe that he would conceive. So this put him in that situation. He's looking at that problem, and now, actually, he could start wavering. But verse 20 says, he didn't waver at the promise through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, verse 21 is a key thing here. And being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Now, the key thing here is coming to the place where we are fully convinced. Our heart is fully persuaded. We're not wavering back and forth. Well, how do you get to that place? Well, there, there's a lot of things that you can do to get to that place. Very obviously, uh, you, you can read and meditate on the scriptures. There, there's n nothing more powerful uh, than starting there. But it's kind of interesting because Abraham did some things that basically would boil down to a, medita a meditation exercise. You know, biblical meditation is one of the most powerful ways you can influence your heart. All meditation, all biblical meditation is, is where you think and ponder and imagine something until you experience it as if it is real and already happening in your life right now. So you say, well, when did Abraham ever do in this? Well, you remember, you know, when Abraham would start to waver and God called him out of the tent and he said, uh, he said, look up at the stars. And Abraham looked up at the stars and, and God said, count the stars. Abraham starts trying to count the stars. So he's visualizing something, and God says, this shall be uh, what your offspring shall be. And so God gave him a place to focus his attention, to engage, literally to engage his imagination. You know, imagination is not evil. It can be evil. It can be good. Uh, and we're the one that chooses if we're going to imagine things that are based on the Word of God and based on the promises of God or whether, or whether we're not. So, so Abraham, he's looking at this, he's seeing this, and so this, thinking about that these, all these stars in heaven represent the uncountable number of what his offspring will be. And so Abraham swings back to the faith. You know, another time Abraham gets a little discouraged, God calls him outside the tent and says, pick up a handful of sand. Abraham picked up a handful of sand. Abraham, God says, count the grains of sand. Well, Abraham, you know, <laughs> I always make this funny story out of Abraham, like one million, uh, you know, 100,000. Oh, and he sneezes, and he's got to start counting all over again. But the key thing is he focused his attention on all of the sand, and God says, so shall your seed be. And so every time Abraham got himself in a wavering situation, he went back and he visualized something. He looked at it and connected what he was seeing to the promise of God. And so this is what kept him from wavering. We can't waver and go around complaining. And by the way, uh, the word complaining, the word grumble, all of those, all, all those words, even anger, all of those words mean to meditate because you're thinking about something until it produces a strong emotion in you. So, so you got to reverse engineer this thing. You've got to get very deliberate about what you're praying in your prayer life. Don't pray the problem, pray the promise. Then you've got to get very deliberate to what kind of conversations that you are having. Don't talk about the problem, talk about the solution. And every aspect of your life, and you may have to avoid people that are negative. You may have to, you may have to step away and not fellowship with them for a while, while you are keeping your heart 
fully persuaded, fully convinced that God is going to fulfill the promise of his word. Listen, hope you enjoyed this. I hope you get the book and the audio series that goes along with this. I have gotten so many incredible testimonies from all over the world about how powerful uh, this book and this series is. So jump in there. And I've got one more message for you in this series. So I'll be talking to you next week. And, you know, I'm going to make it as good as possible. Listen, go to impactministries.com. Check out what we're doing all over the world. All over the world, we're starting Bible schools to raise up leaders uh, to change the way the world sees God. We want people to see God as Jesus presented him. We don't want people to see God as the way Jim Richards would present him. You know, Jesus, uh, he, he is the only being that has ever been on planet Earth that was actually qualified to tell us who God is, to show us who God is, so that we could see him and know him as he is. And, and it's, again, I don't know why people want to look everywhere else. You know, people want to read what Paul said about God. Well, that, that's, that's all right. It's inspired. But they want, then they want to go read what Moses said about God. Then they want to read what David said about God. All those are great. But the real truth is we should, Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. We should begin and end our understanding of who God is because we're looking at Jesus, and we should never accept anything about God. I don't care who the person is. I don't care how famous they are. I don't care how much they've helped you in your life. You don't have to reject them. But we never accept anything about God that is inconsistent with what Jesus presents. Listen, I hope you like this message, and I hope you'll check out what we're doing around the world. I hope you'll even consider helping us finance Yes, because we're going to raise up one billion disciples around the world, and I'd like for you to be a part of it. I'll talk to you again next week.